Our first scripture lesson today comes from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41 of the New Revised Standard Version. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with him, they took him with them in the boat as he was. Our other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let the people say amen. 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 Thank you so much. About uh, 18 months ago, I had the opportunity to take a group of people from the church where Shelly and I were serving in western Kansas to the Holy Land. And one of my favorite places that we went is the place about David and Goliath. Uh, I've decided that uh, this week of Vacation Bible School, I'll engage one of the lessons that the kids are looking at uh, on the week before and the weekend after. And uh, David and Goliath is the topic for this evening. So we were there at this place, and it was this... Uh, um, it, what was really probably the favorite part of it is there weren't other tourists. We were, we were there by ourselves, so we have a little bit of space to roam around and play and dream. But I want to show you a couple pictures and some show and tell. Uh, the story is one where there's a, a conflict happening between the Philistine army and the army of the, of the people of Israel, and they're encamped on two different mountains with a valley between them. Uh, this person you see in this picture is actually standing on one of the mountains, as am I taking the picture, and uh, we're on the side where the Israelite armies were encamped. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's a valley between us. There's a drop-off cliff right there. And then there's some small, uh, like, uh, little buildings down there in the low area. There's a little creek that runs through there, a wadi um, is what it's called. And then he's pointing to a big hill in the distance. And that's the other mountain where the Philistines are encamped. So every day for 40 days... The, um, the armies would come together, and, but they're not fighting the whole army against one another. Rather, uh, this big giant, Goliath, comes out and says to the Israelite people, uh, won't you bring out a, a warrior, a fighter, a, a man of, of some sort, and he and I will have a duel. And the winner of that duel will win this larger battle. So instead of everyone fighting just one-on-one -on -one as a representative. Now, he's a big giant, right? So, of course, they would like to make that the protocol for how it would go. The Philistines would. But for 40 days, the people of Israel come to the battlefront and are fearful and are worried and are scared, shaking, and run away in terror. And then we enter into the story of... Uh, um, David comes, and he's been sent by his father to bring food and provisions for his brothers, and uh, we hear a different story. I want to show you one more picture before I go on, which is, as I was walking through that valley, that uh, creek, our guide said, you're welcome to pick up some stones. So I picked up five smooth stones from the valley of Allah. I've got one here in my hand, as well as a slingshot that I got from over there, uh, reminding me of this is all that it took to uh, respond to Goliath in his life. I want you to listen for a word that God wants to say to you as I read for us our scripture passage from 1 uh, Samuel chapter 17. 
Now Saul and they, the they here is David's brothers, and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Allah, fighting with the Philistines. David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, took the provisions, and went as Jesse, his father, had commanded him. He came to the encampment as the army was going forth to the battle line, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge with the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, this challenge. And David heard him. All the Israelites, when they saw the man, fled from him and were very much afraid. The Israelites said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. The king will greatly enrich the man who kills him and will give him his daughter and make his family free in Israel. David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him the same way, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. A few verses later, when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, King Saul, and he sent, him, sent for him. And David said to King Saul, Let no one's heart fail because of him, Goliath. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, You are not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're just a boy, and he's been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. For your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God." And David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul so to David with his armor. He put a, a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them, all the armor. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them into the shepherd's bag, into the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog, that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army to this very day to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand." When the Philistine drew near to meet David, David ran quickly took, uh, toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand into his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his head. And the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
That's a long chapter. And I cut out almost half of it. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in there that we could engage about what it means for our lives and how it shapes our lives and, and what we might learn as a lesson for who we are. But the part that I want to focus on today is this question of why, why is David so courageous and bold when all the people, go back one, why is David all courageous and bold when all the other people are fearful? What's different about David is what I'm curious about. In many ways, we could probably argue one of the differences is that he has a different set of beliefs about himself and about how the world works and about how God is at play in this situation. And it makes a difference what you and I think. Sometimes we go around life and we say, I can't do that, or that's not possible, or I'm not able. And what do we usually find when we say things like that? That they're true. We, we, we can't do it. If we don't have it in our minds that we can do something, we can accomplish something, we can overcome some uh, addiction or some challenge in our lives, we're probably right. And, and then we try to take action and we don't get anywhere. David has this conviction, this profound faith conviction, this belief that he can overcome this challenge here and the other people do not. And they're overwhelmed with fear. It's really about the beliefs that shape our lives, that govern us, and how we make sense of the world around us. I was trying to think of some different examples and, and how this uh, plays out in our world. I remember, I, I wasn't there, but I remember reading, about in the 1950s, there was a, um, a time when people believed you could not, a human being could not run faster than a four-minute mile. Does, it, does anybody remember that whole scenario? Yeah, it, I used to run track. I didn't run the mile. I ran shorter races. But I remember my grandfather telling me that, that there was a time when people believed you could not run a sub four minute mile. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I think it was in 1954, a man by the name, last name of Bannister did it. He, he, he beat it by just a, a half a second or something like that. And then you know what happened after that? Guess what happened right after that in the next few months? A bunch of people started running faster than a four-minute mile, right? All of a sudden, they discovered this isn't something that's impossible. Uh, this guy did it. I can do it too. It, it, it really was related to how they perceived what was possible in their lives and what can happen in our lives. I think of my little girl. Uh, uh, she's seven. And she likes going to the park, and we'll go play on the monkey bars. And I remember about two months ago, three months ago, she said, I can't make it across the monkey bars by myself. You know, Dad, come, come hold my legs or stand right here and hold me to do this. She could do it. You know, she had strength. She's doing gymnastics. She, she's strong enough to do it. But in her mind, she couldn't do it. Finally, you know, and that was kind of the challenge that a parent is, how do we help our children grow their ability to know what they can do in life and encourage them to live it out? Well, finally, she was able to go all the way across the monkey bars. And then she felt like she couldn't go the other direction. I was like, how is that possible? You can go this way. You can go back the other direction just as easily. There are a multitude of things in our lives where we we get stuck where we're convinced that there's something that we cannot do. We have some limiting belief that's holding us back. And so my curiosity is the uh, question, what is your limiting belief? What's the story you tell yourself about what's possible or not possible in your life? And how does it keep you trapped and paralyzed? For some of us, maybe we argue that, that we're too young to do that thing, whatever that thing would be. Or some of us say the other, right? We're too old. I'm too old. I'm too old school, right? I'm too technologically uh, inept to do something. Or, or we say, I, 
I don't have enough money for that, or I've not done that before, or I've tried and I've failed and I'm not going to try again. What is it that you keep saying to keep you from doing that thing that God might be calling you to do? Maybe it's not go fight in a violent battle against Goliath, but it might be to, to start a new chapter in your life or to start a company, or write a book, or to be a part of a small group within the life of the church, or, or come and help with Vacation Bible School. What, what is it that God might be calling you? And you've got this limiting belief that needs to be checked and considered. When I think about these different uh, persons on this Valley of Allah, there seems to be very different set uh, between the, the bulk of the people of the Israelites as, as well as David. The people of Israelites, they're focusing on this guy and, and this big man who's super tall and big and has been a warrior since his youth and is a champion. They think that he will overcome them, that they won't make it. And not only will it be a burden for them, but it'll be a burden for all the people because all of them will become servants and, and their families will, will become probably shamed and discouraged. And how is David different? He knows that God is at work in his life. He, he, he kind of says, been there, done that, right? I've taken care of lions and bears when I've been protecting sheep that, that I've been uh, in charge of. And just as God delivered me then, God will deliver me in this situation, in this encounter. He doesn't need to be older. He doesn't need to put on the, the, the tools and the techniques that Saul has. He needs to be himself and to respond and to know that God will use him to overcome. What about you? What is your limiting belief that holds you back? I remember uh, in 2006, Shelley and I uh, moved to the Kansas City area, and we started being pastors, uh, uh, associate pastors of a fairly large United Methodist Church in that region. And um, coming into that uh, change, I believed I couldn't preach without notes. So uh, prior to that day, I never got out of the pulpit, and I would read my manuscript. And then the senior pastor where I was serving, uh, she preached without notes. And, and I was like, you can do that? I mean, is that possible? Uh, surely you're going to forget something, right? Uh, and then I started saying, well, she's really special. You know, I couldn't do that. But then when it came my time for me to preach my first sermon, I wanted to be more like her, and so I tried it. And for eight and a half years, I've been preaching nine years, I can't count on the spot. Uh, no, I can't count. That was a, a, a limiting belief right there. <laughs> I, I have been preaching without notes. I still write a manuscript, but I don't use it when I preach. What, what is your limiting belief that's holding you back? I was uh, looking at a, a, a video to this week um, from Michael Hyatt. Michael Hyatt is, a, a, he used to be the CEO for Thomas Nelson Publishing and, and writes and blogs and gives different videos and teaches different things on leadership. And he gave this uh, presentation, a, it's a video or a podcast so you can listen, and it's entitled, um, What If the Barriers Are Only in Your Mind? What if the barriers in your life are only in your mind? If you want to watch it, I invite you to go find it and, and look it up. So often, we let, we let ourselves be our biggest barrier, our biggest challenge in life. You see, God wants to use us to do great and a multitude of things as individuals, as a congregation, within our community and beyond. And it really just becomes a matter of us listening to that call in our lives and that, that invitation, that, um, that desire, and then us believing that we can do it, that we can make a change, or we can try something new, or we can risk ourselves in a new way. And to discover a, an enabling truth that can shape our lives. One of the things I, I have found is I don't always know those limiting beliefs, those stories that I tell myself that keep me stuck and so I need other people to help me ask, is that really true? 
Are you sure about that? Or just to highlight that that's a, a, a limiting belief in my life. And then ask the question, what would be something that would be enabling? What would be a truth that I could hold fast to, you could hold fast to in our lives? For my little girl, it'd be, you can go across the monkey bars, both directions, all by yourself. You don't need me. Or you can try something new. Or you can begin a new change and transition in your life. And then you test it. I was thinking about an example of uh, what, what if you have this uh, conviction in your life that, that if I'm my true self, if I'm authentically me and I'm vulnerable with maybe a small group or, or a family or, or someone else, then they won't accept me in who I am. If I'm truly me, they won't like it. And I'll, I'll get shame or I'll get criticism or I'll be rejected in some way. I don't believe that's the case. I think God, each of us want the other person to be ourselves. And so maybe you try it. You test it out. You, you do an experiment and you, you, in a small way, name how you feel or what's important to you. And you meet people where they're at. Friends, I think we're called to, to know that God wants to use us to do great things. We proclaim that all things are possible through Christ who strengthens us. We say these kinds of things, and then we, we live in a different direction at times, out of fear. Maybe one of the lessons we glean from David and Goliath is to have the courage to be ourself and to know that Christ is with us. And even if there's storms that are coming, we can make it. Won't you be open to how God wants to use you? Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your love and your blessings in our lives, and we ask that you might pour out your Spirit upon us as we seek to be faithful. Give us the courage to be ourselves and to live into what it is you dream for us in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us respond to God's work in our lives and call upon us by uh, singing together uh, our next song, which is, I Want Jesus to Walk With Me. Let's sing. Let us join together in uh, our unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. Help us, God, for we do not have the wisdom to help ourselves. We confess that it is easier to see the problems than the promise. We doubt you. We doubt ourselves. We have been more ready to complain than to accept your help. Help give us courage and boldness when we are fearful. 
O oh God, we open our hearts to you. We want to be healed. We want you to lead us to new possibilities. Amen. Hear the good news. God has listened to us. In spite of all we have done or not done, God accepts us. This is a day of salvation. When brokenness is mended, problems are seen in a new light, and fierce winds are stilled. Stilled. God does not forget the cry of the afflicted. God's affection of us is not limited. Accept the gift of God's love and acceptance, for it is all we need. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We come now to respond to God's work in our lives by the giving of our very best, giving of our hearts and our time and our talents, our resources that God might use us. Won't you give as God calls you this day as the ushers come forward? Father, hear our prayer. Please use this congregation and our gifts to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We come to you seeking your guidance to help us make a difference in this world. Please bless our leaders, our pastors, and this congregation. In Jesus' name we pray. Our closing song for tonight, uh, tonight, today, it'll be also our song for tonight, uh, is um, uh, one of the VBS songs, What a Mighty God We Serve. And you're going to have to move your arms a little bit. They, they got some actions. It's only a minute and 15 seconds. It won't be too long. So let's sing. It, it's a song we've heard before. Go ahead. You can start it. It's a song we've heard before. So just let your little child out. What a mighty God we serve. 